Okay. So, um, in case you weren't watching the chat, brief change of uh, agenda from this morning. Unfortunately, the tag won't be able to meet with us today. Uh, that's been pushed off to Friday. Um, but uh, that means more time for demos and more time for this next topic, which is updates on in-progress capabilities, um, which has my name next to it, but I'm merely uh, coordinating this. Um, Everybody here, nearly everybody here has been contributing to uh, a ton of new capabilities that we're bringing to the web. And uh, I was thinking it would be great to basically run down the list of what we've been working on and have the owners of those capabilities talk briefly about the current status. Uh, probably a good um, uh, format to follow would be uh, introduce the API, talk about what it is, its use cases, um, and uh, current status. And then we should have time for a couple of questions about each one. Um, so imagining about you know two to three minute introduction um, to the capability and its current status, followed by some very brief Q and A about them. But we should have plenty of time. Um, apologies if you're suddenly feeling put on the spot if uh, someone runs towards you with a microphone. Um, but. Just remember, for nearly all of these capabilities, most of the other folks in this room will have maybe seen the name, but not have nearly as much context as you, the experts who are working on this. Um, just before that, though, reminder, we've got some swag, stickers, and pins. So come on up here and grab them. Um, and also, we've gotten um, several more signups for demos later today. Um, Please feel free to add your name on there. Um, but uh, without further ado, let's pull up our good friend, the API tracker. Um, I think Daniel will be uh, talking a little bit more, other Daniel, that Daniel, Daniel G, uh, will be talking a little bit more about uh, what exactly this is presenting. Um, but I think nearly everybody in here will have seen this. Uh, it's all data being pulled from CR bug. So nothing proprietary or private in there. Um, this is definitely our way of just keeping an eye on what all is in flight. Um, and I will kick things off by putting Riley on the spot to talk about one that's not listed here. Uh, one failing with how this API tracker is constructed is that it requires bugs to have public visibility and does not show duplicated bugs. And we had one for shape detection. Daniel, fix that. And then, and then Daniel, I think, fix that other problems, but if it's not on there, I'll say it's not on there. Yeah. So there uh, should be towards the top of this list. And by the way, these are sorted according to heuristics that we might iterate on with what's shipping or what's available for developers to play with soonest. So um, shape detection, which has been available for a while, uh, should be at the top of the list. Doesn't appear. Technical fault. But I hand things over to Riley to give a brief update on what the API is and its current status. Uh, OK, so the, the shape detection API is actually three APIs. It's the face detection, the barcode detection, and the text detection API. And the intuition behind these APIs was that uh, all, all, mo almost all the platforms that Chrome runs on provide some kind of native API for a built-in image uh, recognition capability. For example, Android has um, OCR and face detection and barcode detection. Uh, Windows has. OCR and face detection. Uh, Mac OS has uh, face detection, barcode detection, and not OCR, but at least recognizing the like boundaries of text. Um, and we wanted to be able to provide these to the web platform so that developers could uh, have this capability out of the box without having to um, without having to download, especially for the face detection and OCR large models that are necessary in order to do this kind of work. Um, the interesting difference. Uh, when it comes to these APIs is that idea that we're not going to try to implement this in the browser directly. Um, and so this, this from the beginning, the idea was like, if it's available in the platform, it'll be available. If it's not in the platform, it won't be. Um, this is where that discussion around polyfills and the, the difficulty of shipping an API where we expect someone to build a library and a framework around it comes in. Um, the current status is that uh, we have picked off barcode detection as the sort of first one to ship. Uh, each of them have some some difficulties and nuances that have made it sort of hard to get to get, to get these through. But barcode was closest, um, 
and so we tried, we, we, I sent an intent to ship for that in 78. Maybe it was even 77. Um, this triggered a last minute uh, redo of the launch review process, which uh, surfaced new issues. Um, and that's currently where it's, it's stuck. Um, so it is in progress, mostly blocked on launch, on, on launch issues, not related to the implementation, but related to um, pr mostly privacy. Um, there's a concern around fingerprinting that because like things like, like open, like WebGL, it exposes capabilities of the native platform. It provides additional fingerprinting bits. Um, there's also some concern that various operating system level implementations of these features would log data that was passed through them. And um, we, especially in the incognito mode, we want to make sure that that's not happening. So that's the current status of those APIs. Any questions about that? So not in 78 then? Nope, not in 78. This is not a question about the API. It's more of a comment on the fingerprinting bits. I know I'm not like giving this API specifically, but okay. Um, for everyone in the room, and this might spark a discussion, which we can follow up later on, um, the uh, fingerprinting is a topic that oftentimes comes up, but uh, Chrome's position on fingerprinting is that we want to try and prevent uh, fingerprinting through active detection, and that APIs that expose additional bits of fingerprinting is acceptable, generally, uh, as long as you know it offers real value to the user, and that fingerprinting generally shouldn't be a blocker, or adding additional fingerprinting bits generally shouldn't be a blocker for shipping APIs. Just to level set. But one bit to add on to that, I'm presuming the privacy budget proposal is meant to address the fingerprinting issue. Yeah, like that whole potassium stuff. And yeah, so for 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 the for the the shape detection API specifically, um, the number of bits is low to non-existent because it has to do with basically what version of the platform you're currently running on, which we already exposed through things like the user agent string and is generally kind of detectable. Um, Yo. Oh, Riley, more questions for you. Uh, do we require like camera permission, or how does it work? Does the website actually get the feed, or just the result of the detection? shape detection is unrelated to the camera? So website does not get the raw feed, just the detected shape and the outcome of that. The website has to get the images from somewhere. Um, whether it gets it from the camera is up to the website. If the website is getting it from the camera, then it has to ask for camera permission. Gotcha. Daniel? Can you click the dashboard app? Oh, yes. Thank you. Ah, was fixed. OK. Hey, Daniel. Um, OK, web share target crossed off because it's done. It's finished. It's shipped. Woo. But Peter wants to say something. <laughs> Can we pass the mic back to Peter? So we shipped web share target support for uh, for web APKs quite a while ago. Uh, web share target v2 is now out there, um, but starting with 78 or 79, uh, we'll also support it in trusted web activities uh, as part of the code unification there. So we'll have it on all, mo uh, all mobile services. Cool. And I will also take this moment. Uh, you might have seen me scrolling briefly to show there's web share target up here on this dashboard, and there's also web share target v2. Uh, why? Well, currently, some of these things are tagged as Pry2 versus Pry1. Um, how we are tracking and, and I, what we as part of the FUGU project are using Pry1 and Pry2 to mean has changed over time, and I think we do not have a good definition at the moment um, and should probably revisit it. That is used. Uh, hey, we have some folks from Intel. Hey. Welcome. Uh, full disclosure, we are currently recording. If you have objections to recording, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so the dashboard right now, uh, this is just sorted by what we have tagged as Pry1, Pry2. That prioritization scheme is completely arbitrary, probably wrong um, based on early data. And in some cases, we've updated things, probably worthy of a breakout session to discuss what's the most useful way to assign priorities to these for our own purposes. So don't pay too much attention to the fact that WebShare target is Pry1 and WebShare target 
V2 is pry2. Thank you, Peter. OK. Um, app icon notification badge for PWAs. <laughs> no comments? So it's the Sydney folks who worked on this. Yeah. Um, yep, we don't. Yep. So the sh okay. you got enough context? I, uh... I hopefully have at least enough context to describe what this is. This is um, a feature that lets an install um, little uh, badge on their icon. This is for both mobile and desktop. Um, this on operating systems that support it allow you also to um, badge the actual icon with a, uh, a character, say like an ampersand or uh, a number count uh, that lets you know like how many notifications you have. Very basic kind of capability for installed PWAs. And the current status was this has been an origin trial for quite some time. That's how you would interpret this green bar going back to at least 76, milestone 76, and now extending forward to milestone 80. Um, there was enough feedback that was received during the origin trial that they wanted to change the shape of the API. Um, and therefore, they launched a new origin trial starting in 78, which will extend through 80. And the hope is this is the final one, and therefore, it will ship in 81 in stable. One last interesting thing to mention about this API and its origin trial is that uh, I believe we're still planning to not have the one week of breakage for this API. The normal pattern for origin trials is that we remove it from the platform for one week before it actually ships fully to stable. And I believe that's something that we're not doing for this API specifically. Uh, this is based on a, uh, a partner that really needed it to be uh, not breaking for their users for that one week. And that is an exception that is uncommon, but is something that we can explore. And so for anybody in the room who works with partners, if you desperately need something that doesn't break, come talk to us. Um, yeah, can we pass the mic back? And we do have another mic. Um, I, I know that uh, it was done by Sydney, but um, can we say anything about Android? Because my understanding was it's not possible on Android because the underlying platform requires an actual notification to be shown. So this API is only supported on desktop. Uh, and as it stands, there's no path to supporting this on either Android or iOS uh, because the platforms don't su uh, support any sort of uh, functionality. Uh, for Android specifically, uh, notifications on Android P and onwards can have a small icon bubble on the app icon when there are notifications being shown. But that's strictly tied to actual notifications being in the notification tray. And it's just a bubble instead of something that can be configured like the number that uh, iOS or macOS supports. <laughs> uh, Android has been exploring. So the question is whether we can change Android. Uh, Android has been exploring this in the past. Um, but as it stands, there are no changes planned. Yeah. And also mentioned there is uh, some V2 work planned, which I think shows up later in the list. Um, totally not related to this, but just remembering, uh, again, Sydney folks are not attending, but uh, given that they will be awake at the moment, if anybody wants to ping Ramus or others in the Sydney office and say, hey, we actually do have a meeting code, um, you could hop in and watch the stream. They might appreciate that. OK, um, next one on the list. Uh, Yay, focus versus mouse cursor positioning. Um, not a capability, but I just wanted to call this one, or not a um, new API, but just wanted to call out one of the feature requests that we had that ended up getting tracked um, as part of the Fugu effort was allowing web pages to consume more input activity, in this case, alt click. And this was a piece of uh, work that had been done ages ago, um, and, but except on, correct me if I, mislead anybody here or say anything that's incorrect. Um, but there was an issue on Chrome OS where alt-click uh, was used uh, uh, in a, as a way of doing something via the keyboard. And a new way of doing that had been introduced, but alt-click was still available as a uh, documented way of, of accessing this functionality. Um, 
and it basically stalled. And so web developers who wanted the same experience with alt-click to work across all the desktop um, platforms for the web couldn't do that. And uh, as part of the Fugu effort, we were like, hey, can we escalate this and really get this fixed on Chrome OS? Um, and that convinced the folks working on this to uh, do the last little bit of work to finally deprecate uh, uh, alt-click for the old mechanism or as a secondary key sequence for this functionality. And starting, I believe, in 78, so the, the ship indicator might be wrong, um, alt-click should be available for websites to consume. Um, so not new capability work that um, anybody here had to engineer, but we were able to provide that little bit of push to um, really uh, make it that consistent across uh, sites. I think that shows up for some other um, items as well. OK, enough of me babbling. Um, over to Finner or Peter to talk about Contact Picker API. So you'll get both of us. Uh, Finner will be giving a demo of the Contact API later on with more information. Um, at a high level, we entered uh, Origin Trial in Chrome 77. That's going uh, pretty well. Uh, we're seeing a bunch of users, no, no extreme numbers, but in the tens a day. Um, we have received uh, feedback through the uh, Origin Trial system, uh, particularly from Instagram, um, who are quite happy about it. Uh, and we've received a lot more feedback, interestingly, through the GitHub repository of the standardization proposal at the WICG, also giving feedback, primarily resolving around the absence of a select all button. And that's something that Finner will go into more detail on later. Um, as it stands, there's great engagement uh, also from Microsoft on the, on the specification. And we'll be talking more about this next week at TPAC. So stay tuned. Awesome. Uh, and these end up being a cluster that I think Peter ends up getting to talk about uh, because his team had a huge uh, number of things go out to Origin Trial in 77. So uh, get installed related apps. So that's an interesting one. It was mentioned earlier this morning because it's been in Origin Trial for quite a while. This is actually the third time that we're running an Origin Trial for this. And there's a little bit of an interesting chicken and egg problem here. There are a lot of companies that are really interested in this API, but they're not interested or they don't have the ability to run an Origin Trial right now in order to really give that feedback. So we're seeing the interest. Uh, we're hearing the interest through our partner communication channels uh, quite, quite vividly, in fact. It's just not being reflected in origin trial usage. So as it stands right now, this will be an origin trial for, I believe, another milestone, maybe two. And after that, we'll have to make the decision, do we proceed with this uh, and go full on a standardization and get it out there shipping enabled by default, which we're probably going to land on, given what we're hearing from partners and how they how they really need this. Um, so that's, that's something that will be quite interesting. Um, in the next few weeks, at the very least, we'll work on a standard proposal. Right now, it's just a, a really bare-boned explainer. So we'll really ramp that up. We'll make sure that there's web platform tests uh, and get it in shape for really going out there. Why can't they participate in origin trials? Uh, question is, why can't those companies participate in origin trials? Uh, logistics reasons, uh, philosophy reasons for their end. Um, but but what we're also finding are priority reasons. Uh, get installed for related apps is a sort of API. Um, like it, it really applies to applications that have a mobile web presence, but also a mobile native presence, given that right now it's tuned for Android, but hypothetically it could work on other platforms too. But it's really the sort of policy feature. So you use it either to deduplicate notifications, or you would use it to say, um, change a button from install my companion application to launch my companion application. And those those are great improvements. They're they're nice, but realistically they're P2 or P2Prees. So it's just much easier for them to be able to have it on the backlog. At some point there will be a hack week or something like that and they'll implement it rather than really prioritizing it on top of all the other requests we have for these companies. So this API is pretty old. Um, started before Fugu formally. Um, you said something about standardization. Um, how, like, given that there's an implementation and so on, and we talked about it since 2015, 16, maybe. Um, like, uh, do we do we do anything special about standardizing this now? Given the fact that we shipped it already, or is there like what what do we do about that? So. 
at when we started implementing this um, quite a few years ago, as you say, the decision was made to just stick with an explainer and don't really start working on the spec. And that's our risk. So once we uh, so we won't do anything special. And if standardization shows that a different API shape would be more appropriate, or maybe a completely different system, then that's the risk that we've taken by not standardizing this earlier on in the process. Uh, do we expect criticism? Um, not if we play this right. So it will go through all the normal channels. We'll accept all feedback as we should. Um, and well, yeah, this was a decision that we made, and um, we'll have to live with that. One thing to also add is this is like on the Microsoft side, we're looking through for places where there's probably a Windows side thing that we want to try and do. And this was a prime candidate of one where we've had asks as well. And since it's currently mobile only, it's one that sometime in the next couple of months, I think we want to partner on figuring out how we build the equivalent for desktop. Cool. Uh, yeah, that would be fantastic, uh, particularly for standardization purposes. Having your support would be a big uh, plus. Okay, periodic background sync. So another one for me, you must be tired <laughs> by now. Um, periodic background sync. Um, so recall that background sync is a really confusing name for what means event when next online. Uh, and think of it as, uh, think of one shot background sync as uh, your, your chat application, the user can write a message whilst offline. And the second connectivity is regained, you want that message to be sent to the network. And it's quite a sensible thing, but background sync sounds like something completely different. And periodic background sync is what it sounds like. You request it as a website, and at some at some interval, at some frequency, your search worker will be woken up with the ability to synchronize content. So imagine on your morning commute, you might open a news application and you're, you're in the train or somewhere where there's no connectivity. You want to see those latest articles. Um, periodic background sync implements this in, uh, in, a, very, in a very sensible way uh, by having the developer indicate the preferred frequency, which could be as often as they want, but then based on the amount of engagement that the user has with the website, so what we call site engagement score, uh, together with a global limit for Chrome itself, because we don't want to start Chrome up for, for no reason too often either, um, we'll wake up the website uh, if it's installed right now for a first iteration to give them the ability to do that synchronization. Um, it entered origin trial in Chrome 77, uh, so far, we're primarily working with a number of Japanese partners. Um, apparently, I'm not quite sure where, but this country is particularly interested in this API, and we're seeing most uses from here. Um, Kenji has a lot to do with that. Uh, Kenji is a PM that we have here. And uh, we're really looking uh, right now at optimizing the implementation further and then proceeding with standardization, uh, which also involves uh, further formalizing background sync that's kind of stuck in the WICG, and we should also continue pushing uh, across the standardization track. Awesome. Looks like no questions on that one. Uh, wake lock. I'm not quite sure who should take this one. <laughs> Oh, hi. I'm Riju. I am from Intel Finland, ANSI and me. I work on Chrome. ANSI works on the API part, and we have Kenneth somewhere in the tag meeting. So, yeah. So, regarding Wake Lock API, it's just it's an API to prevent, uh, to allow web apps to prevent device to going to power saving state. So we have two parts. One is the screen wake, screen lock, and another is the system wake lock. This specific part is the screen wake lock part, where one of the customers can be Google Slides, where you're presenting and you don't want your screensaver to appear, that kind of thing. So uh, everything is done. All code is landed. Uh, I think we are ready. Uh, we wrote a design document, Riley. I think you have approved that, right? Yeah, uh, so I literally have the intent to experiment. Yes, I was going to say that yeah. when Riley has time, we can send. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have sent all the parts, and it's just the sending part which is left now. Yeah, this is an example of an API from Intel where I've I've oversubscribed myself on the amount the, the, the number of launch reviews I've volunteered to to take these through. Um, the intent to experiment is in draft form on my laptop right now. Yep. 
um, but is generally uh, ready to go. And we have, um, a note. I think we, we're, we're in, in good shape. Um, I think the only risk is that uh, there are some issues open on the spec, which may indicate may, may lead to like another yes, API change. But uh, I talked with Rafael, and that he's telling that the changes might be not so much. And within origin trial, I think we can accommodate yeah, some. That's, that's the purpose of the yeah. of, of the origin trial process. And I just wanted to share an anecdote about this API. Um, a couple of months ago, at a Chrome all hands internal, uh, Alex Russell and I were queued up to start talking about Fugu, and the previous presenters left the slides uh, frozen for too long and the screensaver kicked in. So it was great that once they finally, after multiple people jumped up, managed to get it unlocked and then Alex Russell and I stepped up, we were able to point at this API as, look, we're solving real problems. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Sam, next. When I took plus one, the use case for wake lock too, I, 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 I Coordinated multiple slides the other day too, and I ran into uh, the screensaver kicking in. Um, SMS receiver. Um, so we are we hit seventy eight for origin trials. So hopefully that will go well. Um, and we're just uh, waiting for feedback. We um, pr prior to seventy eight in seventy seven we started engaging with partners. Um, and so there are three partners that have already implemented against Canaries. Uh, that's OU Times and PayPal surprisingly for payments. And so, um, yeah, hopefully everything will go well and we'll learn more about, um, we'll get feedback and we'll course correct as needed. Anything else, Ayo? Am I forgetting anything? Very good. Questions about that one? Okay. Um, one thing I did want to call out here is a uh, new addition to the, the tracker is this flag here. Um, and there's a comment up above in the legend explaining this is dev trial. Um, we wanted to start visualizing in the tracker when new APIs were available for developers to try behind the flag. Um, the big green bar, when it's an origin trial, that's when we're going to get developers actually deploying it into production and having real users face that, um, uh, face the API. And uh, that's very critical for us working on Chrome. Uh, very critical milestone because we have to have full launch review prior to that. Um, we have to have privacy sign off on it, UX sign off on it, et cetera. Um, but even prior to that, uh, we're able to get developers playing out or playing around with the API on their local system. And in many cases, um, for example, with the serial API or hit API, that's where we actually expect we're going to get the most feedback about the shape of the API. Um, so we're calling it out here. And uh, that's something that we've done um, in Chrome forever on the web platform, um, getting things available behind a flag, waiting for developer feedback on that, and then moving it into closer to shipping with origin trial. Um, but we'd like to almost formalize that step a little bit more. And so Sam has been working on documents, which you know we haven't fully bought into internally yet, um, just circulating these thoughts. But one name for that, just to give it a catchy name like origin trial is dev trial. But really, in some ways, it just means available behind a flag, Let's start actually booking developers and getting them to try this out. And Sam, go to. OK, uh, need a file system. Yes, got the mic. so native file system gives web apps access to your native file system. And it's currently available behind the flag. We have all the approvals for origin trial in 78. And we'll be working on adding new features. And so yeah, the current implementation is pretty much a bare minimum. And a bunch of new features that Microsoft is working on that we we're working on for later milestones. And we're getting a demo of that later? Yes, Olivier will give a demo in the demo. Awesome. Any questions about that one? Awesome. OK. Uh, notification triggers. So back to. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'll take this one to uh, remove some of the uh, load from Peter. Um, yeah, so we've touched on this briefly before. Um, so to give a bit of a context, uh, what we actually got as a request is like a general um, API for tasks to be run at a certain time. Uh, so think of that as a um, cron job for the web. Um, but what we've 
decided on is that that's actually quite intrusive as of battery life for the user. Uh, so if, especially if there are a lot of websites using that API. And so that that's where we decided to split that request into um, like all the use cases that we saw websites would use those uh, APIs for. And so instead of building one really powerful API that can solve all the use cases, we split it into multiple APIs, um, like some of the, which is um, like background sync, uh, periodic background sync, and uh, now uh, the notification triggers. And so with these APIs, we, we think we can do a better job of separating those use cases of, of apps um, while still allowing um, the device to operate in a really efficient way. Um, and so for notification triggers specifically, um, so that allows a developer to specify when a notification should be shown. And that when uh, does um, imply things like Chrome might not be running at that point. That means that we actually schedule uh, a task on the operating system to uh, display that notification at that point. And so for the first version, we are doing that on Android. Uh, the other ones require not, uh, not a Chrome to be running. But um, some systems already have that capability, uh, for example, iOS and, um, and Mac OS. And even Windows has um, like native support for that feature. Um, and we're looking to expand that API in the future uh, for other capabilities, like not time-based triggers, but also like different things like location-based triggers. And that allows, again, a, a slew of uh, features that would have requested a different, more powerful API, but um, yeah, I think we, that's the better solution for us. And yeah, so we're launching that as an origin trial in 78. Oh, thanks. Any questions? No? OK. Uh, next up, I want to put Jared on the spot. So I want to pass the mic back uh, to talk about unlimited storage, which is another interesting one where this is not a, not a new API, per se. Right, so um, this is, uh, I think it, it, it's marked that it's shipped, but what we have shipped is expanded uh, limits, not, not fully unlimited. Um, and, and these limits are for site storage APIs, how much an origin, uh, how much disk space an origin can consume. Um, so previously, the I think, Chromium had a limit of 20% of disk space could be consumed by all origins, and each origin can consume uh, about a third of that. So that worked out to be about 6% of your disk space could be used by an origin. Um, and what was just shipped last week is Chrome can use 80%, and of that entire pool, an origin can use up to 75% of this. So this is about 60% uh, of your hard drive that can be used now. Um, so this enables things like uh, offline mode for media services, right? Music, movies, things like that. Yeah, this is something where we looked at what had been done in the Chrome Apps uh, platform with just the ability for a site to request unlimited storage access. Um, but trying to bring that to the web as a permission didn't make sense because the, the question of what do you ask the user it would be a very confusing question, given that sites can already store things. And um, we're looking at potential follow-on work here um, uh, around introducing additional UI or altering the numbers further in the future. But um, I, you know, from my mind, going from 6% to 60% for an origin is a huge change. And I think that's one of the reasons we show it is success. Yeah. But yeah, this is just a first step towards getting to limited storage. Right now, the priority is like the corresponding UI so that we can um, Notify users that maybe Chrome is pushing their their device in a disk uh, storage pressure, so you know, uh, low available disk space, and then allowing them to recover from that. Worth noting that this is very much intended to support uh, offline um, playback and people being able to actually store things for later on. So, just to point another question: Is there a big developer purpose for this? Is this something we need to be telling developers about? So the question uh, is, do we need to be, is there a big surface for this? Is this something we need to be telling developers about? No. Yeah, 
That's an answer to the question whether we need to tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Probably is actually worth up to the cost of the Like, when you get the Netflix app, you get offline payments. Yeah. And so I can't and offline on my MacBook. Luckily, I can't have my card work. The, uh, yeah. the Chrome team does have a relationship with Netflix, and Netflix is aware of this. Okay. Yeah. And we are. <laughs> Everyone wants. Yeah. 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 And quote Go ahead. There's some discussion around um, the get estimated storage. Um, probably this will change. And um, get estimated storage. Um, there's also a discussion for how fingerprintable will this make us if uh, all of a sudden yeah, people will get more fine grained or less fine grained information about how much storage they can use. Is there anything from an engineering point of view that we needed to know? Like we desperately lying about whatever, the amount of storage that you can actually use, like um, with RAM, for example, where we cap it artificially at 8 gigabytes, what we report on. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand how this uh, can... So the discussion that I'm aware of is that um, people who say this increases our fingerprint uh, entropy bits um, will say, now all of a sudden, people can get way more fine-grained information about um, who is this person? Because they can just ask how much storage can they, can I use, and like that, because we report on RAM, disk space, and something else. I think um, that this increases how fingerprintable we are as a browser. I, I think this doesn't change how fingerprintable we are. Um, people can already go look at our source and see what the old uh, limits were and do the math themselves to see, right, like the, the uh, drive size, right? If it was 6% was your quota, then you can, you know, do the math and figure out their drive size. Right now it's up to 60%. I, I think it's the same as it was before. Just for the people not aware, um, for RAM, this, this get device memory, whatever it's called, API, and um, I reported this back where I said, hey, my MacBook has 32 gigabytes of RAM, but the API only reports eight. And I thought it was a bug, but actually it's not. It's intended um, because at some point we just say if the device has enough storage, where we right now say it's eight gigabytes, um, we don't need to go any more fine-grained because this will just increase our fingerprint finger, fingerprintability, if this is a word. So um, the argument then is for disk storage. If you have three terabytes or six terabytes or 10 terabytes, at some point it doesn't matter anymore because you can only store that many movies. So um, is there anything like that where you say, look, we don't really report on exactly how much storage you have, but at some point we just say you have enough, like whatever, one terabyte free and that's it? Yeah, as of now there's no limits like that, um, but I think Victor has something more to say on this. Thank you. So what we need here, uh, use cases. Suppose we kill the quota API completely, and you just know that you can write until you get an error. Who does this break? Which applications will be uh, negatively impacted by this? Um, I So to reiterate the thing that I said earlier, fingerprintability is not a reason to significantly change an API unless equivalent functionality can be provided while avoiding fingerprinting. I would support us saying that, uh, let's say that you have like 32 terabytes right now, I think the limit is like 80% or something like that. Uh, I am happy to only report through this API the amount of storage that your site can actually use and just cap it at that because you can't use more than that anyways. Um, doing the thing where you get an error when you run out of uh, storage space can lead to some very negative potential habits from developers where they will allocate and store memory until they get that error and then potentially clean it up. I know of a few partners who do this with RAM, uh, where they literally just uh, allocate enough RAM until they crash, and then they ask their users to restart, and then they allocate that much. And that's a real thing that happens in the world. And just a little more flavor around this one. Uh, Chrome had a, has had a quota reporting API that would give that precise degree of how large the user's disk space is back to 2011. So this is definitely an API where we could consider um, retroactively going back and capping it or quantizing it to reduce the, the fingerprinting of it. Um, this is also quota and the way quota works is incredibly inconsistent across browsers. Um, so to the, the point about 
should we document this? Um, there is an effort to start documenting how the different browsers on MDN, I believe, how different browsers do allocate quota. Um, Mozilla has woken up from its slumber and actually has uh, an engineer there who's interested in advancing um, the primitives available around storage um, with an eye towards tell the developer less, but give them a, a tools instead. So instead of saying, this is how much you can store um, down to the, the precise bytes, give them buckets that they can put things in with priorities uh, that control how they're evicted. Um, probably much less straightforward for developers, but would reduce the fingerprinting. So it's an active area of discussion. Um, right now, as Jared said, we really just changed one number, uh, which is a, the fraction available to sites, well, multiple numbers. But um, so we don't believe by doing this, we have increased fingerprinting, but it's definitely an area that um, we've got our eyes on. Okay. Uh, next up, Web NFC. So over to you again. Yeah. Uh, so we all know what NFC is. This is about bringing the NFC functionality to browsers. Uh, the difference between Web NFC and native NFC is support for card emulation. We are not planning to do that, as at least on the, in this version. Some context. Last time I was in Japan in 2015, we demoed it. Uh, the web NFC part, but now after four years, the API has changed so much that I can't even recognize. Uh, we were talking with a few developers. Uh, for, I think Fosua from Google DevRel team is also helping us, giving us a, a perspective what app developers would want. Uh, the API shape has changed a lot, support for different types of records, are coming. Um, so we had to push milestones a bit. <laughs> um, hopefully by end of this year, we have to talk with some privacy folks around. <laughs> Riley and me have to sit and have to, and have to find them. Uh, uh, OK, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking around trying to find Balaj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, so now I know your faces. Uh, 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 I have some demos in NFC. If you guys are using Chrome Canary, you can use in your phone. I have some NFC tags, and we can play around. Yeah, I think that uh, for Web NFC, the one of the things we were we were we were struggling with a little, a little bit was finding um, interested partners. Um, yes. This is one of those APIs where you're giving somebody something that they've never been able to do before, and that makes it difficult to find partners because right. they already wrote their Android and iOS apps, and they're like, okay, yeah. what? <laughs> so uh, uh, the use case is like the smart posters and conference kind of thing. So hopefully. If you guys know some partners who want to use NFC, let us know, and we can take their feedback. OK, uh, next one is also being developed out of Sydney, so I'll speak to it. Um, ability for websites to be registered file handlers. Um, this is follow-on work to the file system, so it's uh, inevitably going to lag by at least a milestone. Um, basically, being able to indicate in the uh, Web App Manifest that there's this thing called a .docx. And if a user double clicks on such a file, this website would love to be able to open that. Um, obvious use cases include things like Google Docs, being able to open Word files. Um, there's been a lot of iteration on this um, in uh, exactly how this would be manifested in the manifest. Um, and the team, I believe, has it working on locally on Chrome OS. Um, and they're working through. Um, uh, support on Windows and running into things like being able to show exactly the icon that they want. Uh, they are in touch with our friends at Microsoft. Um, and again, that's likely should be available behind a flag uh, and going to origin trial within the next few milestones. Oh, sorry, that was that one. OK, Any questions about that one? Uh, the question is, are we in touch with partners? Are they ready to work on it? Um, 
I'm not in the loop um, there, but you know, this is something that from both internal and external partners, uh, I won't name specific names, but they've been requesting this for forever. Um, definitely it's like this next thing after we say we're building file system, they're like, and can we handle dot whatever files? So, um, maybe get into this later, but right now our current thinking on whether or not to expose things to installed sites is, is whether or not it um, fits in with being kind of an installed application. And so in the sense that you would expect in, in the sense that you would expect a uh, installed PWA to show up in your like application drawer and in your like setting screens and in your management screens. Uh, you would expect an installed PWA to show up alongside all the other applications when you right click on a file and say open with. Um, we're looking into seeing whether or not there's a way that we can do a permission uh, for this thing, but um, no signs as of yet. Okay, uh, next up, Serial. So back to Riley, unless Riley's coming up. Okay, hang on to the microphone, Thomas. Um, okay, uh, so the, yes, Thomas, would you like to share with the class? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Web Serial API uh, is a continuation of the work that my team has been doing on Web Bluetooth and Web, uh, web USB. Uh, we're also working on Web HID, which I guess I'll come up to talk about later. Um, but spoilers, um, we are trying to move the existing Chrome dot uh, APIs uh, from the Chrome Apps platform that built a lot of this peripheral support onto the web platform. Um, and so Serial is one of those missing pieces. And the use cases for this are actually a lot of the same use cases that the web uh, USB API had. Uh, most Serial devices are actually not sort of the classic Serial port. They are uh, USB devices, but they because they are Serial USB devices, they need a separate API because of the way the operating systems work. Um, so we've seen actually a lot. We've seen a lot of developer support for this. Everybody in the embedded space, which is also a lot of educational customers, are uh, have been using these APIs. They've been trying to use uh, Web USB for this, but they've run into some issues. This fixes that problem for them. And so we've gotten a lot of uh, feedback. We have a number of sites that have already started to try to use it. Um, some of them because I patched them to use it. Some of them because other people have been working on it. Um, and so this is this is looking to be a pretty um, uh, a pretty active origin trial uh, when that comes out. And I'm planning on doing that in uh, Chrome 79. Um, this is a capability that is you know scary from a security and privacy perspective. We are taking the same position that we had on the previous APIs where we're using a chooser. We're giving the user the control of picking a particular device um, instead of giving having to have, having them install a native application where they have they implicitly give access to all devices. Um, and so that sort of that that, that resolves the uh, a lot of the security and privacy questions. Um, the you know, remaining concerns are simply around the question of do users really understand this prompt um, at all? So um, any questions? Thomas? Wait, Thomas, can you pass the mic to Thomas? It's Mike, a Tom. stupid question, but is this meant to replace web USB or is this meant to coexist? Um, yes. Yeah, so let me let me, yeah, let me back up a little bit on that on that oh, that operating system API question. So basically, uh, in an ideal world, you would have an API for USB and an API for Bluetooth, and you'd be done. Um, the problem is that uh, the way the operating systems are built. If you have a USB or Bluetooth device that presents a standard interface, so something like storage or camera or serial or HID, um, the operating system wraps that device in a layer that understands how to uh, present that higher level API, and the browser cannot rip that off. And so we have to provide an API that, that, that meets the operating system at the layer in which it exposes the device. So that's why we're building serial and HID, um, because even though most serial and HID devices are USB, Operating systems allow us to interact with them at the only at the serial or HID layer. Um, this also allows us to support serial and HID devices that aren't USB or Bluetooth. Um, you have ser uh, some computers do still have built-in serial ports. Uh, devices have built-in HID devices, uh, or HID devices connected using other mechanisms. So it gives us 
it, it's on one hand, it's a little annoying. We have to do this work, but on the other hand, it gives us a little bit more flexibility. Okay. Okay. Next up. Next up, raw clipboard access of Darwin in the back presenting. Yeah, really. Uh, yeah. So I'm working on raw clipboard access. Uh, I guess like web serial, it is trying to we're trying to get some more like lower level access to things. So right now, uh, generally when you use the clipboard, the browsers or user agents are all like um, trying to branch out for every uh, operating system for you and like do the encoding and decoding and sanitization. Uh, raw clipboard access is uh, part of, um, due to re requests for uh, compatibility with native applications, there's a lot of like proprietary or like just not web standardized uh, formats that are not available on the web right now. So uh, raw clipboard access aims to help us support that. Um, there's a lot of exciting security and privacy questions that are raised <laughs> because um, this is, uh, you would be essentially plumbing a blob of data straight to the operating system level. Um, so a lot of exciting questions there uh, that we're talking about both with uh, Chrome security and privacy teams and externally with say uh, Apple WebKit. Or any questions or I don't know. Oh, just that we're uh, so the question was what was the thing I was talking about with UpKit? It was just uh, we're just involved in talking with them for uh, say the tag review process and they're commenting on our explainers. So we're having a discussion. Yeah. Uh, okay. At, how are the talks? Do they like it? <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> I think uh, talks with Chrome security and privacy are mostly friendly, and we're wrapping up <laughs> um, with uh, WebKit. Um, there's some stronger opposition, but we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> it's going to be good. Um, is this API generally triggered for like, you know, paste data coming into a web app through uh, the user invoking with control V or is it through like maybe an application's menu edit paste kind of a thing as well? So you need uh, the application to be able to trigger the API beyond the user invoking something that the browser intercepts? Um, so yeah, this would be a user activation. Um, so user activation is not currently required for clipboard APIs, and raw clipboard access is building on the existing like asynchronous clipboard API, which does not require user activation. So this is something that has also been brought up during uh, reviews. Uh, so a question Jared just asked was, what is user activation? So user activation is like um, the uh, like the user doing some sort of like action, I guess, before. Um, it's often used to trigger, like allow APIs to be triggered. So for example, um, currently the clipboard API, you could read or write data without the user ever like, uh, so there are requirements such as like secure, secure context and um, active frame. But then like uh, if the user is already clicked on the frame, um, JavaScript could just continually um, pull for or write to the clipboard buffer. So uh, user activation, what has been requested by people is to um, require to be required so that the user would have to at least like click or something. Um, so if like I copied a password from somewhere else and I just went to your website and I had that focused, they could pull from that. Is that that those are like the issues that are being brought up. Oh, uh, so these are part of the issues. So you actually need to have uh, granted permission to that site in the past, but due to the way that a lot of Chrome's permissions work right now, um, you, if hypothetically if you had granted permission a long time ago and then like visited the site a year later, uh, it's possible the site is no longer uh, would you would no longer trust that same site 
uh, with that information or with this permission anymore, and they would still have access to this permission. But th this is part of the uh, clipboard API that we're building on top of. So, but yeah, these are being brought up. Okay, uh, next up, app icon shortcut menu for PWAs, also known as the jump list. And I'm hoping somebody from Microsoft can talk about this one. I can try, but uh, John is definitely the best person to do it, and he is landing like right now at Narita, okay. so I cannot quickly ask him. Um, but basically, we're the work that we want to talk about tomorrow around bringing identity to apps on Windows is kind of a prerequisite for a lot of the integration uh, points for a lot of this stuff. So there's progress being made, but we don't have something that's um, available to try out quite yet. And I should probably mention at this point, we're on the on the spreadsheet here. Um, the numbers are getting fuzzier and fuzzier <laughs> as we go into the future. Um, next one, I believe, also is one that Microsoft was very interested in. Pursuing. Yeah, <laughs> um, basically all of these that are more like OS integration capabilities. Um, there's some prerequisite work that we need to do to really be able to unblock any of them, which is really around letting PWAs identify as true apps rather than as sites where the browser is doing something special with them. Um, so, so far we've been looking at a lot of these on the latest versions of Windows because they take dependencies on new Windows things. And then we're talking to the Sydney team on how to make sure that there's some story that goes down level as well. So figuring out sort of across the different Windows versions, how deeply integrated an app like um, PWAs can be. So there's a lot of interesting discussion here, um, but unfortunately not super tangible here. We can show you exactly where it's at. Okay. Thanks. Um, we'll probably do the next few out of order. Um, over to Chase to talk about the font enumeration API and also the font table access API, which is two down. And then we'll cycle back to Riley to talk about HID. Yeah, that's great. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm Chase from Google, and I'm working on uh, two APIs that you can kind of collectively call and what we're collectively calling the font access APIs. Um, and so the status update for these are so close that it just makes sense to do them both at once. Um, the, uh, the general uh, context here is that uh, web browsers today support the ability to reference and use uh, local fonts uh, on web pages. Uh, and you can do that through CSS rules and there are other parts of the web browser that expose this ability. Um, but what you don't get today in the web platform is a way to uh, get a list of all of the locally installed fonts on a device or get access to the uh, data that's within each of the fonts to do something with. Um, and these are just two missing capabilities uh, in the web platform. Um, so enter the uh, font enumeration API and the font table access API uh, uh, proposals. So the font enumeration API gives the ability uh, to enumerate across a list of locally installed fonts. Um, and then the font table access API gives the ability to request um, the tables that are within a font. Um, and so across each of the different operating systems, they are implementing uh, support for, uh, for example, the true type or open type font formats. And those font formats define the uh, information in the font files as a set of tables. Um, so any application that wants to get a list of the fonts um, and then wants to get the uh, data within the fonts to, for example, uh, render uh, text in their application uh, would use these APIs. Um, we have partner support. Uh, Figma, uh, which some of you have heard of, uh, is a, uh, a company. They, they produce uh, a web application that allows uh, UX designers to create uh, designs and to share them internally and to work uh, together using a web application. Um, they have implemented parts of this system using uh, local programs. And so these APIs, they're very interested in implementing because then they can not have the maintenance burden of a local API. And I would also say that they have some uh, activation burden. So as a, uh, for users of their application, they have to go through extra steps to install these local applications. Um, 
other I, uh, other notes about the status. Uh, so the I2I, I filed an I2I, I filed a tag review request, the Chrome status entries up. Um, we've been getting feedback, um, responding to the feedback, adjusting the explainers, explainers have been posted, um, and the implementations of work in progress. Um, we'll see if I'm able to pull a demo together. I'd love to. Um, I'm getting close, but uh, I need a little bit more time. Um, and then we're going to uh, probably be talking about this at TPAC um, next week. And let me just add, um, obviously, there'll be the question about fingerprinting. So for font enumeration, we would imagine that's behind an actual explicit permission. Yeah, so I should mention this too. So a lot of the discussions that are happening, um, the majority of the discussions around these APIs have to do with the privacy and permissions models. Um, fonts are actually referenced. Uh, in a lot of uh, places about uh, some of the dangers uh, in the web platform or in web uh, systems as a way to fingerprint users. So they provide a lot of entropy. Um, so if a user has installed a one-off font on their system and websites are able to get a list of all of the fonts on the system and they see, oh, there's this one extra font that very few systems in the world actually have, uh, then it becomes an avenue uh, for identifying users so we're very sensitive to that. Um, we propose to put this API behind a permission, and uh, the discussions we're having right now are about like what should that permission look like? Uh, what, how do we present the permission dialogue to the user? What capabilities uh, do we expose then to the application once that permission has been granted? And uh, the current explainer introduces this using um, uh, kind of words that describe how uh, different user agents may choose to implement that permission. And so uh, different vendors, different user agents may uh, decide that they want to implement this API and they could implement the permission um, and they will present the prompt to a user and then allow or reject uh, based off of what the user responds and then show those local fonts if the user is allowed. Another user agent may choose to never show the permission prompt and just auto reject uh, this request. And in that case, they can still implement this API um, and they could always say return a static set of fonts back and thereby defeat any attempt to fingerprint the user. Um, and there's been a lot of, uh, like I would say there's been a lot of focus by um, some other user agent vendors such as Apple uh, in their recent uh, platform updates and the recent browser updates to restrict the set of local fonts that are exposed and even to remove the ability to reference local fonts in some cases. And so we're sensitive to that. And we're uh, thinking about these APIs in that context too. And then I guess the last thing I'll mention is, is this is slated for dev trial in 79, origin trial in 80, and uh, ideally a release around milestone 83. Cool. Uh, Riley, do you want to come up and talk about WebHID? Um, yeah, so most of what I said about Web Serial applies to WebHID. Um, specific, WebHID, um, it, so to explain what HID means, uh, HID stands for a Human Interface Device. Uh, so this is a class of USB, Bluetooth, and other uh, transport devices that uh, are, are usually used as input devices. So your standard keyboard and mouse is, is an HID device. Um, the HID sort of framework uh, is also used for more compl complex devices, such as gamepads. And the, the real advantage of HID is that it is, a, is very self-describing. So a device, when it's connected, can tell the operating system, these are the buttons I have, these are the sliders I have, these are the, light, the LEDs I have. Um, and that allows you to write a very generic driver that supports many devices across um, sort of a wide, a, a wide range of, of hardware. Um, for various ecosystem reasons, <clears throat> Windows, uh, a lot of sort of peripherals that you wouldn't cons typically consider to be input devices uh, are HID. Um, and so when we were developing the Chrome Apps APIs, we included HID because of these peripherals. And so really, as with Serial, this should kind of be considered as an extension of web USB. Um, it's trying to support the, the variety of USB peripherals that are out there. Um, and the API is specifically designed not to cover um, the very common input devices that we that, 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 that you have. So it's not going to work for keyboards. It's not going to work for mice because we already have higher level APIs 
for keyboards and mice. And the web platform is already very opinionated about how you access a keyboard and a mouse. You have to have focus. There's all these concepts around those input devices. So WebHit is for uh, the more esoteric game pads. Uh, a number of game pads actually aren't uh, sort of very standard HID devices. They're a bit custom. Um, and uh, and also the devices that are just completely not input devices at all, but they're just using that using that framework uh, as their sort of basic uh, communications channel. Um, so this is going to have the same sort of security and privacy concerns. Uh, we're going to be using a chooser. Uh, we're going to be um, you know telling the user all about what what, what, what what it's doing. But the reason that the reason that we've like aside from just this question of like making the web perfectly capable, we do actually think that that uh, using the web platform for the, this kind of hardware actually makes users safer. Because the thing about the web is that it is, it is a sandbox platform. And even though you're giving the, the, the site access to a particular device, you're not giving a site access to every device. Uh, we have an opportunity here on the web platform to sort of come up with a better device access model um, than what native platforms uh, traditionally create. Um, so, step off my soapbox for a minute um it's uh, going to be it's currently in dev trial as of 78 um and we're going to be uh starting an origin trial in the chrome 80 range questions hey joe um yeah well gamepad api is will gamepad api eventually be deprecated then uh, that is a so that 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 is a really excellent question. Um, and that's kind of a question that applies to all of these hardware APIs. Is like if some particular type of hardware becomes so popular that it makes sense to develop a higher level API for it, would we deprecate? Um, would we deprecate using it with a low level API? Or conversely, like if we provide a really good low level API for it, would we deprecate the high level API? Um, I don't know. Um, I think that it would. Yeah. Vince, do you want to talk about gamepads? Uh, I know the answer to gamepads. Uh, the problem with gamepads is we have some gamepads that are not available via HID. So um, for example, on some Microsoft platforms, you have to go through the, um, the DirectX APIs to access gamepads. Yeah. And I think that might also be true in some other platforms, yeah. like on Mac OS, to get access to a PlayStation controller, it might I'm, I'm not certain, but it might yeah. be. The so same. for the same reason that we have the hit the hit API instead of just the USB API, we have the gamepad API because the operating system has a gamepad API, and some devices are exposed specifically at that level. And does this provide an on ramp for some as yet uninvented input device? Yes. So that that is an is is that's that's kind of the ideal use case for this is that this gives you the ability to develop some kind of you know maybe some kind of input device you know something that goes like way beyond what the game what what game, what you, you would traditionally traditionally consider a gamepad um, and build support for that uh, on the web platform and we've you know we, the some of our early um, our early users of these are are things like uh, things in the telephony space so there's a whole piece of the HID spec that involves uh, telephony devices, things like headsets with like extra buttons for call control and LEDs that aren't really served well by the existing operating system APIs or the uh, or web standards. Thank you. Um, I want to again skip out of order. Uh, Hong Chan, uh, you can pass a mic over to Hong Chan to talk about low level audio API. And apologies if I messed up your schedule. I know you had to get out of here for a. No, it's fine. Meeting. Hi, my name is Ong Chan. So I work on this low-level audio API, and I'm and I'm also working on the web audio API as well. So the goal of audio device client API is basically it give you the uh, device level access, like for audio device, and provide developers with the, the like functionality for low-level audio manipulation and input and output. But if you look at the evolution of the uh, audio API in the web platform, it's kind of interesting because we started from the audio element, which is super high level, super abstracted, and super overloaded. Then we had uh, web audio API. It's kind of an intermediate layer. It's not low level enough, but it gives you this some sort of like some level of uh, some degree of interactivity. But now we're moving on to different era, which is a real low level audio uh, audio API, which is a device client. Uh, currently, it's it's in the uh, it's it's in the form of a proposal, so it's being actively discussed in the venue uh, audio W three C audio community group. Um, 
So over um, next week, I'm I'm really looking forward to the discussion we'll be having in the TPAC. And uh, currently, um, the most exciting thing about this low level API is a better WASM support because uh, that's what a lot of developers have been, have been asking. And also, we want to have a really nice integration with the, the other part of a low level low level APIs like, uh, for example, Web Codec or Web Transport. And I can talk about the, the other uh, little bit of uh, uh, benefits of this audio device client that we uh, will we are having in the wish list. And uh, one of them is it will it will just follow the autoplay role, autoplay policy by default. And also, it will have some ability to select the audio device that you prefer, um, which is quite su uh, super important for VR headsets. So, and also surprisingly, uh, a lot of kiosk machines out there they need this feature. So I, I was kind of very surprised by the fact. And also of some, of some of the ATM machines. And our audio device client uh, API will be a proper replacement for Chrome Apps Audio API as well, which was a really low level API. It just gives you the low uh, uh, callback, callback function so you can fill the buffer in. And it also makes sense uh, because tons of audio code is written in C and C++ and a lot of audio developers, they want to just simply compile their original source code and put it into the web platform. So, so far uh, what we have is um, we published the explainer on the audio community group and uh, there have been some de design discussion going on internally, externally, uh, with the several key stakeholders like WebRTC team or the other three uh, third-party partners. And also, I posted some API design under the audio, audio community group. And we settled on the logistics and the, the document progression. So uh, we're going to work on the spec design and the published draft under the audio community group, then it, it and then it becomes mature, then we move on to the audio working group so we can actually have a W3C spec on it. Uh, currently, I'm working on a prototype uh, based on audio worklet and worker and shared array buffer. So this is kind of a hack that a lot of audio developers have been working on it because the audio worklet is really easy to utilize in that way. So the purpose of this prototype is basically evaluate to evaluate the API ergonomics with close partners first. So we don't do any kind of obvious early mistakes. And what's missing from this uh, early prototype will be uh, actual device selection because uh, this is a literally polyfill. So there is no ability to select the device or uh, like callback buffer size configurability or low, low latency IO, all of those uh, nice sweet benefits from actual implementation will be missing from the prototype. But this is just purely evaluate API ergonomics. And once I'm done with the, working with the prototype, I will publish this, uh, this code uh, under, uh, after TPAC. So um, my plan is to uh, work with the close partners uh, with this uh, uh, all the prototype first, so we can collect all the feedback from the de developers, and we will continue to iterate on it. Uh, in, another interesting part of this audio device client is we already have uh, uh, some close partnerships uh, lined up, and Ableton, they are quite dominant in the, the pro audio market, and Audio Kinetic, they are uh, the author of Wise Game Audio Engine, and Propeller Hats and Soundtrap, which is a part of Spotify, also Facebook Audio 360 team, they also interested in this API as well, because uh, obviously they work on the Oculus headset. And so the main, uh, main application use case will be game audio engine, music production, and potentially some teleconference software as well. And this is kind of a shameless plug. Um, so I will be having uh, I'll be giving a short talk on uh, Friday evening. We will be, uh, there's an event called WebXL uh, Music Developer Meetup in the same building. Um, I will be talking about uh, why audio device client was designed, or why is it for, uh, who is helping, or something like that. So timeline of this uh, proposal and design, will, by 2020, uh, first quarter, I like to have something working. So. I can work with the uh, partners in the like native implementation. Um, so feel free to ping me if you have any feedback or opinion on this feature. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Um,
according to schedule, we've got about nine minutes left. So I'm going to pick and choose um, and skim over some of these things. Um, service worker launch event and badging API used from a service worker being done in Sydney. So no reps here to talk about it. Uh, low level storage API. Um, another name that's been called out for that one is MMAP for the web. Um, in other words, how can we make it so that uh, if you've got a bunch of existing C, C++ code um, that is used to literally paging chunks of files into memory and then flushing them back out, like say every database engine ever, um, could be brought to the web. Um, there's a team in Munich that's investigating that. Uh, very early days there, but they've identified some missing pieces um, in WASM itself uh, that would need to be added. So um, this is not an API that anyone is rushing to uh, get into origin trial tomorrow. Um, but taking very uh, deliberate look at what would be needed to get out of the way of high performance uh, storage needs for apps. Um, and then diving into the priority two, again, priorities on here don't really mean anything. Um, we've shipped some stuff, uh, image support in the async clipboard API. Um, Darwin alluded to that, uh, WebShare target v2, hooray. Um, uh, this is a feature request from somebody. Um, there could be a whole separate topic about uh, local networking and socket capabilities. Um, but more, I wanted to point out that uh, this is the first seven digit bug number that I've seen. So Chrome is a million bugs, woo! Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, uh, compression codex, Adam Rice, uh, working out of this office, just sent out an intent to implement. For this one, a uh, lovely little level primitive. Browsers already speak uh, deflate and, and some other uh, compress and decompress mechanisms. Why not expose that to the web? Um, but uh, I want to ask uh, Stephanie and or Mike to talk about window placement and screen enumeration APIs. We want to filter microphones. And where's the other mic? Right here. OK, do we want to give one to Stephanie? Yeah. Yeah. Flick the switch. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so screen enumeration is the foundation for other APIs like the window placement API. Um, basically, we want to expose the displays that are connected to your computer. This is usually, usually gonna be like your built-in laptop display or an external monitor that's hooked up. Um, and we want to expose some display properties so that apps that say want to present um, can determine out of all these displays that are connected, which one's the best one for your presentation and which one's the best one for your speaker notes, et cetera. Um, yeah, we have some basic implementation behind a flag, but we're still getting through um, talks for privacy and security. And yeah. Right, I think the, the screen enumeration aspect is in pretty good shape. Um, and uh, at least in terms of the explainer and an initial implementation that p folks can experiment with behind a flag. Um, and we're looking at some good options around window placement. Um, and yeah, those explainers are currently uh, we're iterating on them and definitely looking for feedback. There are some interesting partners in the uh, financial tech space and uh, medical space presentation uh, and display advertisement. Uh, I, I would want to add, Microsoft also uh, published an explainer earlier this week on uh, Windows segment enumeration API. So very similar to screen enumeration, but supporting more foldable use cases. So I think we're going to work together on how do we combine these uh, proposals? Awesome. Cool, okay. Um, I also think uh, I'm gonna make the executive decision that we will, um, we're almost done with the list, but I do wanna eat a little bit into the break time. So maybe chew up five or 10 minutes of the break uh, intentionally, um, just because we have several things here um, with, for example, folks from Intel that can talk about it. Um, these ones have interesting backstory. These are, again, not brand new capabilities, but hey, we've actually done the right thing by uh, Fugu prioritizing some work um, and getting some existing stuff that installed 
um, carried over the finish line. Apologies for the sports ball analogy. Um, but ambient light sensor, uh, can we get a mic over to read you? Uh, uh, again, privacy issue. Yeah, again, a privacy issue, I guess. This time I'm going to give this privacy guys some bad days. Uh, I think uh, Riley and I proposed something. Balaz has kind of ticked it. We are adding the tests. So as when we go back after this conference, I think the code should be there. So Awesome. And yeah, we should get some guesstimate dates in there. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, exposing ambient light sensors to the web. Uh, it's part of generic sensor API. So all the sensors on your phone, uh, which are accessible on your uh, browser. Uh, we had already shipped accelerometer, gyroscope, and mag uh, yeah, accelerometer and gyroscope. Uh, magnetometer and ambient light are the ones which are left uh, because of uh, I don't know, how do I say trade-off between use cases and privacy? So we are trying to decrease the entropy bits by uh, decreasing the value and decreasing the frequency of polling. So yeah, if you want to read about really creative attacks, yeah. The <laughs> It's fascinating what people are able to discern from these sensors. Yeah, so the interesting thing about the sensors APIs, and this also applies to the idle detection API um, and, and fonts and all these things, is that they're exposing pieces of system global state. So you know anything about this, anything about the, the system or its environment that you you know can't really segment by origin. You know the the room is just as bright as it is whether you're looking at Facebook or YouTube. Um, and so that's the, the, the concern. We want to make it possible for sites to uh, implement features that react to changes in brightness. So, um, but the thing is that you actually really don't need all the accuracy that the sensor can provide in order to do that. So for this, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're reducing it down to a level, I think, of like 50 lux and also implementing some things to make sure that it doesn't like it sort of moves slowly across the range. So it's very difficult to use this to correlate data. So with all these changes, at least uh, the attacks which we had known earlier could not be replicated. But uh, you know, I don't know new attacks. So we'll see. Uh, a part of this is also shipping part, uh, shipping magnetometer. The major use case is compass and maybe used for calibrating VRs. We can talk about it. Um, okay. Any other questions? Um, almost done. Back pressure for web sockets. Uh, again, being worked on by Adam Rice out of this office. Um, this came out of discussions with partners who were um, big fans of, for example, the Chrome apps uh, sockets APIs. And they're like, we're trying to switch over to web sockets, but it doesn't give us this, that, and the other thing. Give us a give us a raw socket API. We're able to say, no, no, no. We we can address these. Um, cases by incremental additions to existing APIs. Not always the case, but this is one where we're definitely pushing on that. Just and as a reference, I believe this is now going under the name WebSocket Streams. Yeah, so repeating that, WebSocket Streams, uh, which is basically, yeah, delivering on back pressure by bolting stream support onto WebSockets. Um, user idle detection, Sam or Ayu? And who has a mic? You got a mic? Hold it up. Uh, okay, so user idle detection. So, um, so we, uh, how do I put this? Uh, so, we have run into a uh, privacy uh, bump challenge, uh, and it's a uh, it's one that's uh, well well documented, and I think it's well. Um, understood to some extent, but it's expensive enough that um, to mitigate it, uh, it will require non-trivial work. And so, what we did was we um, we uh, established uh, dev trials uh, for to enable it uh, to, to enable us to engage with partners 
before we uh, spent more engineering uh, effort in this API. Uh, and so uh, we have not yet solved the uh, privacy challenge, but partially de deliberately, we are at a phase where we're asking developers to uh, to use this API. And um, and uh, for our intents and purposes, uh, uh, the, 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 the API that is available in Canaries right now is in a perfectly valid state for you to try uh, to, to check if it uh, solves a real problem for your app. Um, and uh, if we find enough demand for this API, uh, we'll at some point collect feedback from developers that this is an API that is uh, uh, useful enough for them. And if we find enough demand, then we'll, we'll invest further resources. But uh, the stage that the state that we're at right now is that we're you know looking for we're looking for partners. Um, we've been working with a few uh, here and there. Um, but the but the, the but, but now we're Dynamite, Gmail, and um, uh, Slack, and some of the the, the other chat apps. Um, but the state that we're at right now is we're letting the the partners engage and and actively working with partners and collecting feedback. And it, if 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 demand is proven here, we'll we'll invest the engineering resources to unblock ourselves. So it's in Jetra. That's correct. So it is available in Canaries. Um, I, a, part, a lot of the dev trial formulation was was established partially to to, to categorize this API properly, in, in the sense that um, where, where we're at is that it's the the, the API is implemented. It's not it, the, all, not all the bits are flipped in terms of privacy and security and so on. But um, at the stage that we're at is outreach. You know, we we need partners to try this API and give us early feedback uh, and tell us that they need this very much. And to James's point, yes, it, we're lacking the lovely indicator here that it's available behind a flag. So we need to update that in CR bug. Daniel sent out, uh, Daniel G sent out instructions on uh, exactly how to tag that. And so we just need to do that and refresh this. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. And down to the last two that I think we should talk about here. Um, Finner, how do you feel about talking about Video Picker? So this is an augmentation of the photo picker that's uh, launched the stable and has been there for, for a while, uh, supporting still images. This is to support the video files. Um, a prototype has already been submitted to the tree and it's available behind the flag. It uh, needs uh, UX love, UX guidance from the UX people. Uh, but uh, I, I think it was last week I got a green light on launching it uh, basically uh, in some form or another. But we're going to do it on Android N and up limited to that, which includes uh, uh, restructuring for uh, dec safely decoding videos. So awesome. that's the status of this. Cool. OK. And then I'm going to declare the last one we should talk about is uh, camera control of pan, tilt, and zoom. Right. So, yeah, it's landed behind a flag now. Riley asked me to add some UMA. I've, it fell off the radar, so I have to do it. Uh, we can check that uh, I got a camera which can pan, tilt, because the tag folks nearby were not were concerned about the privacy part. So anyways, I'll demo to them. So if you guys want to see how it works, it works on Chrome OS and Linux. So. Awesome. Okay. Um, so uh, hopefully everyone feels as overwhelmed as I am with, with the sheer amount of work that everybody here and, and some folks who aren't able to make it uh, have been putting in on advancing the web. This is amazing how much stuff we've got in flight, how many more capabilities we'll be adding to the web, how many more tasks we'll be letting users accomplish on the web. And you know, more to come, although anything beyond that line is pretty fuzzy in terms of exactly what should we do or how should we do it, although media codex, media codex yeah, so. Um, codex yep, yeah. yeah, so, and probably there's pry three stuff in there that is already in flight, yep, yeah. so, um, cool. Uh, so next up, break until three o'clock, um, followed by demos, and uh, mostly for the benefit of the Intel folks, 
that popped in. Uh, you already signed up. Excellent. Okay, cool. So see everybody back here in 24 minutes.